Thank you, Councillor Kerr. I'm mindful that Councillor Bradford has still not arrived. Right, okay. So, does anybody want to make a contribution or do you want to wait for. Okay, we'll come back to that. I'm going to go to the floor now. I've had three indications. Sorry, four with yours, Jane, Councillor Corbett. Um, I've had an indication from Anna Bain. Like to... Did you make an indication to speak? Yeah, yeah Councillor Bain. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about the impact of the government's austerity has had um, on the backs of our working class. It's no, no coincidence that the poorest and most in need councils have been hit hardest by this government. And those that we spend most of our funding on, the poorest and most vulnerable, have been hit every which way by this government. Back in 2010, when the Chancellor, George Osborne, said, we're all in this together, while in 2012, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Danny Alexander, told the Lib Dem conference, we simply will not allow the books to be balanced on the back of the poorest and hardest. In March this year, the Equality and Human Rights Commission published analysis showing to the contrary to Alexander's pledge, changes to taxes and welfare payments since 2010 have indeed hit the poorest hardest. The overall impact of the changes made since 2010 have been dramatically to reduce the net incomes of the poorest households. The pain is also unevenly spread between men and women, especially single parents, whether they're in or out of work. And if you're a woman of colour, then you're likely to have been hit even harder. And disabled people are very hard hit, particularly those with severe disabilities. Households with both the disabled adult and child can see on average a loss of at least £6,500 per year. The appalling two-child limit of benefits has hit large families. And the changeover of disability living allowance to personal independence payments has hit people with severe disabilities incredibly hard. Perhaps the most harmful of the benefit cuts is the four-year freeze on in-work age benefits and tax credits. This has seen the extraordinary and most obscene use of the phrase in-work poverty. We used to think the best way out of poverty was to get a job, and this is no longer the case. The introduction of universal credit, whose original intention was to improve work incentives and family incomes, now penalises those it was intended to help. in work poverty is an oxymoron. It sums up this government's view of the working class people that we are expendable. We should feel lucky to have any form of work. We should be grateful to accept the charity of other working class people through the use of food banks. The casualisation of work has somehow become normalised. I go to the picket line at Camel Lades where the company are trying to get rid of full-time staff and bring in casual workers on less pay, poorer conditions and are easier to dismiss. At Matalan last week, I heard from staff who were on casual contracts who could be called into work at 10 o'clock at night and be sent home at 11 because they're no longer required. And when they make the point that the buses have all stopped, they say, well, walk or get a taxi. Well, clearly they can't get a taxi because they haven't been paid for the work. At Asa, in entry, we heard main, mainly from women who were on the picket line who were talking about the company's changes to contracts and they were saying that they've got to go make sure that they work weekends, including Sunday and bank holidays, and that also meant that they were taking a pay cut. If they didn't sign those contracts, they were going to be sacked. When we were at the RMT during the ceasefire dispute against P&O, I was genuinely taken aback to hear that those seafarers are paid less than the minimum wage, £3.86 an hour. They work eight weeks on, four weeks off. Those four weeks is considered downtime. So they don't get paid sick pay, they don't get paid holiday pay, and they're not entitled to pensions. How is this allowed to happen? How have we come to this being normal as a society? And of course, what we're seeing is that this is not just the private sector that's exploiting workers. We've got the Royal Hospital, we've got HMRC, and we've got Network Rail, who've outsourced their cleaning staff to the private sector companies so that they can exploit the workers instead of being can direct I, then, exploitation. Can I just point out that this is a discussion about the budget? That's what I'm coming to, Lord Mayor. I'm proud to work with colleagues 
that have brought services back in house here in Liverpool, where our agency staff have been made payments, and working closely with the trade unions, we've improved services and we've ended up saving money for the council. Um, we, we've seen through the outsourcing contract and we are making sure that our public sector partners should do the same. Lord Mayor, those in society who are least able to challenge or fight have been hit hardest by this government. Lord Mayor, as councillors, we must speak up and speak out against the cruel political neoliberal ideology that's driving this government's agenda to attack the working class. And Lord Mayor, we know that there's likely to be an election in the next few weeks if the Tories get back in. The suffering we see with now will be nothing compared to what Johnson and Mogg will reap on cities like Liverpool. Lord Mayor, we must unite when that election is called. The only way we will ever see the working class, our rights, our children's rights, the environment, the economy and an equal society in this country, that this country and this city deserves, is if we ensure we get a Labour government at that election led by Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor, for your contribution. Can I just make it known that this is going to be a very, very crucial debate. And in order to get the conversation focused back on the budget, we actually make great uh, points there and salient points, uh, Councillor Ben. Let's try and stick to the budget for the next round of speakers. Can I ask Paul, Councillor Paul Brandt to speak? Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, the presentation that we received from the Mayor earlier and, uh, and the Director of Finance is, is, is salutary. And we see many of the councils already be aware of the financial cuts that we've sustained. But that reflects just one half of the, or one side of the coin that we as a council are having to um, manage because the other side is rising demand for services in the city. In my portfolio, we are, uh, through uh, demographic change, seeing a significant increase in the number of people, uh, residents in the city who are over 65 and over 85. Very often, those individuals are accompanied with um, increased requirements for social care packages. We're seeing a rising number of people in the city living with dementia. We're seeing the associated consequences and costs of, of making sure that those people are supported. What many people may not know is we're also through medical advances and the care packages that children's services provide, seeing a larger number of people with mental and learning disabilities surviving into old age in a way that they would not have done in the past. We have a statutory responsibility to, and we would anyway because we are a caring house, but we have a statutory obligation to make sure that those individuals' needs are met and we have very little discretion to make to, in the way that we meet them. Those demand pressures within the system are not adequately reflected by the way that we are funded from central government. Indeed, by the contrast that we've seen, we've lost over 63% of our central government support since 2010. Public health. We see the ring fence grant in public health. The government talk a lot about protecting the NHS, but public health transferred over to Liverpool and councils in 2013 has experienced a cut in absolute terms on that ring fence funding. Over £8 million already from the relatively small grant we get here in Liverpool. And make no doubt that the effects of that, if we were to impose cuts on our drug and alcohol services, mean that families, whose parents or carers, or maybe on the edge of care, don't get the treatment and support that they need, and those children, and those relationships often break down, and children can end up in care. We see an increase in the number of rough sleepers in the city if their support networks are broken down and they can't manage their substance misuse issues. We see an increase in the demand for sexual health services in the city funded from our public health grant. We see a rise in um, multi-drug resistant gonorrhea across the western world and in parts of the northern cities already and we are seeing a significant increase in the number of individuals accessing sexual health services in the city which means that we have to maintain uh, extra resources to fund those, uh, um, to fund those uh, uh, attendances at hospital. The rising need uh, and rising demand that we have to meet in this city is met with uh, a one-off funding spending review and although the Mayor rightly indicated that some of the 
grants that we weren't necessarily confident would be carried on have been now indicated that they will be maintained. They don't represent new money, they represent just the continuation of the money that we are currently getting. So they don't necessarily meet the increased demands that we are seeing and the increased pressures. And as the Mayor rightly said, and, and the Director also rightly said, our capacity to raise some additional money for adult social care through a council tax preset is way less effective per capita in this city than it will be in a city with higher council tax bans because it raises lower amounts of money per property because 80% of our properties are in band A or B. So it is a highly unfair and unequal way of meeting adult social care demand. The demand sits in places which have the greatest degree of deprivation, which tend to have the lowest council tax base. And to enable us, and for the government to say that council tax precepts are a sensible way of meeting rising demand, it makes no sense. In addition, we are unclear as to whether or not the new money that was announced in the spending review will be distributed fairly. Practice and history teaches us that Conservative governments have always gerrymandered the funding formulas in a way that assists their areas and ways that assist them electorally. And if anyone has any doubt in that, you should look at the newly announced Towns Fund in which um, the couple of million pounds, or the, it was about 20 million pounds that was, invest, that was announced by the government, was reviewed recently by the Magistrate Evening News in a great piece of informative, inquisitive journalism, and they identified that almost every single town that was benefiting from that newly announced fund was a marginal Conservative seat, or one that the Conservatives hoped to win in the next general election. And it was put to Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, who expressed some surprise. Let's be under no doubt that the mere fact that large aggregate sums have been announced in the spending review probably is going to be taken of the hope that we're given by some indication that there will be more money made available, may well be snatched away from us by a gerrymandering of the funding formula. Lord Mayor, it is clear I think for everybody on this city council that the austerity that we have had imposed upon us is a political choice from central government, both in terms of the aggregate sums and then one in Andy Dow's batch, you look on the Institute for Political Studies website, that clearly shows if for almost every in, uh, cut to public service funding, the government, the Conservative controlled government since 2010, has introduced some form of tax cut that almost balances out the amount of spending cuts. This is a, an agenda to produce a small state. That political choice, though, of austerity has been imposed and done exactly what George Osborne promised not to do, which is that it has been balanced predominantly on the backs of the poorest communities. But it also has a catastrophic effect in costs shunting across the public services, when we see an increase in street rough sleeping, when we're seeing an increase in people who are forced into hospital because their, their support packages for them in the past have, uh, not, are no longer maintained. We are seeing an increase in people suffering evictions because the housing benefit and housing grant support is no longer there to help them maintain their tenancies. We're seeing an increase in family breakdowns resulting in increased numbers of children in care. Lord Mayor, not only is this an unfair and immoral political choice, but the government cuts have, have implemented a false economy across the public sector. They do not save money overall. And for that reason, Lord Mayor, I welcome the unified approach for a cross-party motion so they send a clear and powerful message to government. This austerity must stop. Councillor Barry Kushner. Uh, thank you, my Lord Mayor. So, so in response to Councillor Kemp, just a couple of things that I want to remember with you. One is that um, you mentioned the last Labour government and the 2010 Labour manifesto that you said that subsequently you weren't going to mention, but you'd already mentioned it. The other thing is that, um, is that you said, and I probably share with you, that the impact that Brexit might have on our communities, but of course that's what we said when, um, when we embarked on austerity with the Liberal Democrats, seeing hand in glove with the Tories in, in 
in uh, producing and devising the policies with some gusto that we're now suffering from today. So it would have been good to have heard that then. But I just want to focus on my area really, and something specific and related to the debate that we're that we're having at the moment. And that is that even though um, we've lost £420 million in funding as a council, 63% of our budget, we are still being exploited by private organisations that are charging the council um, money for fees that support their investment vehicles that they've taken over in order to deliver those services. These aren't small private companies that are adding on extra 5 or 10 percent to make a profit. These are large, these are large companies in residential care and foster care that in the foster care market account for around £600 million pounds worth of foster care spending throughout the whole country. They are responsible for 45% of all foster care placements. And these companies, although they may have been once independent local companies like Foster Solution, Fostering Solutions likes to think it, it does in its shop on Smithdown Road, but they are not that anymore. They are part of huge holding companies. That one's part of 81 companies that are part of a huge, of part of a huge holding company. And what they are is actually investment vehicles because they're owned by financial equity companies. That one is owned by Sterling Capital Partners. And that, they are using foster care because of the regularity of the fees that they get for fostering in order to increase, to attract investors, to increase the value of the company so they can set on later on that profit. So from 2012, when that company was bought by a huge, by, Stur by, by a huge other private investment company before they sold it to Sterling Capital, that between 2012 and 2015 they doubled the value of a foster care company and they doubled the value of it by increasing the fees that they charge for councils like, like ours and others up and down the country and also by trying to get as many, um, as many foster care placements as they possibly could. And they value, and it's a bit, it's a more disgusting way of talking about this, but their main asset, foster carers, and the reason why they managed to, they doubled the value of the company between 2012 and 2015, they doubled the value of their company in three years, which is 33% increase in value of the company each of those three years by revaluing their key asset, which is a foster carer, from £50,000 per unit to £100,000 per unit when they sold it in 2015. That company has now, had to, has now borrowed and invested still additional investment that it has to pay back in 20, 2022, 2023. And all those companies combined, those three big ones that are responsible for £600 million of that market, they have borrowed and have invested, have to pay back £750 million. £750 million. If you spread that across the country, that works out evenly to every council that, that works out at about eight million pounds and this is the point really because these companies charge double what we pay our own registered foster carers they charge more for residential care fees than we are going to be able to pay from, from, from the homes that we've already opened and the other ones that we're opening later this year and again next year that we're having to pay these private these private companies and they are, they are taking that money so that they can invest, pay back their investors and be good on those investments so that when 2023 comes, we've got enough money to pay it back, that has to stop. So we can talk about all these issues and things that we have in, in, in the council and we talk about them in the chamber. And I get, I, and I get, I'm not bored about talking about it, but I talk about it over and over again because it's something that we could actually do as well as the government giving us our money back. These companies, need to be told that it's unacceptable for a council like ours, whether we have the money or not, actually we haven't, for us to be exploited to finance these takeovers and these investment vehicles on the back of the most vulnerable children in our city. It's absolutely disgusting. And I invite every member of this council across every and all parties, civic society, the press, the radio stations, the business sector, the voluntary sector, all other ranks of the public sector need to make it clear and right and I'll give everyone their addresses, the names of these people and these organisations are right to them and make it absolutely clear that the fees that they are increasingly charging to us are completely unacceptable. We are only spending by £7 million in children's services and I'll tell you why, because we've got 30 children more in residential care services in, 
in Liverpool than we anticipated. And that, as well as being a cost to the children themselves, of course, that cost this city four and a half million pounds. Four and a half million pounds. Not because that's the actual cost of looking after children, it's because we also have to pay back the profits of these companies so that they can make good on their investments. So we have to make that absolutely clear. We also have to make clear at every opportunity, we need foster carers that are registered with these private companies, they have to come over to the city council. Because to combine, if we do those two things, we will save this council between six and 10 million pounds each and every year. We will probably improve the quality of our service, but we can secure our children's centres. We would have to put a 4% on our council tax. We all have to take responsibility for this. This is a problem and an issue that we have for our city. And I welcome the fact that this is a cross-party initiative to go to the government and make it clear where the underspending is. And we need to say absolutely clearly that the LGA have been saying, that other local authorities have been saying, that the voluntary sector has been saying, that there is just not enough money in councils to cover the needs of looked after children up and down the country, but particularly in this city. But we need to say this to them as well. There's no point in giving us some extra money for children's social care if you're going to revise the fit in the fair funding review how you fund councils and you take disadvantage out as a waiting factor for councils because you'll give it to us for children's social care and you'll take it away from somewhere else. And we need to tell the government that they need to introduce better and improved regulation so that we as councils can make sure that companies that have residential care provision in this city make those places that are available to our children, not to councils up and down the country for, for as much money as they, can, as they can possibly get. And we also need to say that in adult social care and in children's social care, we need to take profit away. Councillor Kushner, I've had indications from Councillor Corbett, Councillor Small, Councillor Doyle, and Councillor Simon. So, can I take your contribution, please, Chair? Oh, Councillor Corbett, I should say. Thank you, um, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Corbett. Um, we're looking at the budget in the context of um, police cuts, about 30% now, education cuts, cuts to health, cuts to housing, all the 24 changes to welfare reform. And we're actually, as a council, picking up um, what's happening from all of those cuts out there and they're piling down on us. Um, we've been trying incredibly um, well, I would say, and in a joined up way, to look at how we respond to all of that. Um, and we've been doing that over a number of years. So if you go back to uh, the Fenix Commission, Joe, which you set up in 2012, we've got all the recommendations from that which we're piling through. Uh, we've got the Getting By report to see the, the voices of people most affected, which we use regularly. We changed our procurement strategy in September 16 to take on board um, good business that we would do, that we would procure with, rather than just go out to, to ones that are driven by profits alone. Uh, we've gone through all our welfare reform community impact assessment and told the government to do one and they refused and said they couldn't do it. Well, we did it anyway, we showed them how to do it. We took it down to government and they completely ignored it. Um, sort of us gave evidence to select committees, they ignored that. There is no way that they don't know what's happening, they do know what's happening. We pay the real living wage, not the only messy living wage of the government um, count. Um, and we do that also, one of the very few, or perhaps the only local authorities that do it from the November rather than wait until the following April when it's set. We've got our Fair City policy in there that shows how we do fair business and also we try and um, support all the anti-poverty uh, strategies coming through. Um, and just looking at some of the figures, um, since 2015, our top-up, our council top-up to discretionary housing payment uh, to date has been 4.26 million. Now you could say, well, it's a waste of money because people should be able to get, get that out of the back pocket. But of course, if, if they're made homeless, we have a statutory duty to pick them up, and that can be four, 10 times that. Okay, so that could be 40 million that we're spending out on that. So that's a saving, although it's a cost to us. You look at the system support scheme. So when the government refused to fund any further, that's our local welfare scheme from 2015. We spent out just under £14 million on that. That's literally keeping people fed, 
keeping them warm, keeping them clothed, keeping them with beds, mattresses, bedding, wardrobes, washing machines. Mayor's Hardship Fund uh, that Joe set up, the Mayor set up, an extra £2 million over three years and that comes through all sorts of different ways directly to individuals and also directly to the ward so we can respond on that, on that level. You look at the council tax support scheme, that's cost us to date 24.3 million and more. So I can't, and it's much, much more than that, but that's the, that's the minimum that it's cost us. And again, that is trying to support people knowing how much they can pay so we get money in um, as much as we possibly can. And then just taking one example, so our uh, brilliant uh, benefit maximisation team costs us a million pounds annually, but brings in uh, to the residents we're supporting at least 10 million. But of course we don't see that 10 million, but we, we fund the, the million. So if you look at all that joined up thinking and joined up working, I'd just like to say as well across the city, we've got the voluntary community face sectors, we've got the good businesses working with us. Um, I've got my, yeah, here, this will wake you up. Fan support the food bank. Bad job, thank you very much. So seriously, there's so many people across the city that are working together. I just want to say thank you to those, to those people there. Um, but we've got to fight back and we can't just set an illegal budget because all of that ethical working and ethical thinking and ethical practice and anti-poverty strategies, as people have said before, immediately goes out the window. Because we're not talking about a sane government here. We are talking about very, very right-wing Bullington boys who actually just want to get in and, and they don't care and they will direct uh, the officers that send in and all of that good work that is joined up thinking and, and joined up working will literally just go out the window. So just to finish on, as, as Liverpool we fight back in our own unique way um, and also as Liverpool we're very good at linking up with all the other authorities, uh, the core cities, uh, the LGA we need to get right in the middle of it too because you've got some influence there as well with the, uh, the churches, with the faith groups, all, all of those guys, and we fight back together. And that's when the government gets scared, especially when Liverpool is in the middle of it. So just to, to finish on Raymond Williams' quote, which I often use, great Welsh socialist, they are Tony, a Welshman in the middle of this, to be truly radical is to make it possible rather than despair convincing. So let's carry on doing that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. I watched the other night when David Cameron was interviewed and with no, no remorse, no regret, no apologies, gave a defence around what his government had done from, from 2010 onwards around bringing in austerity. And it really was a political choice that was made by that government. And I think it was a failure not just in terms of the human cost of austerity that we all see in our wards and in our communities across the city and beyond, it was a failure in terms of what it set out to do. In March 2010, government debt stood at 69.6% of GDP. That was three years into a global financial crisis. In March of this year, government debt stood at 85 percent of GDP. So in terms of reducing government debt, in terms of what it set out to do in economic terms, it was a complete and utter failure as well as the human cost on top of that. And I think if you look at how Liverpool has been affected by that, we've been disproportionately affected by the way in which that government and subsequent governments chose to implement austerity in terms of local government. It was a cut to the revenue support grant, to the mechanism that was the equalisation mechanism between richer and poorer councils. So cities like Liverpool, with a, with a lower council tax base than other parts of the country, were disproportionately affected by that because it was the government grant that was cut. What that's been replaced with, whether it's business rate retention, which of course, because we've got fewer businesses and despite the work that we're doing, we have fewer opportunities to raise as much money as in London and the South East and in other parts of the country, we don't get as much money back that we've lost. And even when we can raise council tax with the adult social care precept, it's regressive 
and we don't raise anything like the kind of money that we need to be raising and we need to be bringing in to the city from those sources. And set against all that is the cumulative impact of austerity that we see across this city, where we see pressures on spending, we see need increasing. And Lord Mayor, yesterday I was talking to a foster carer and Councillor Cushion talked about 30 extra children going into care in this city and he said to me, tell anyone that this isn't to do with the cumulative effect of austerity. It isn't about stress and anxiety and pressures on parents that is causing children going into care. So all of that means that we've got more pressures in this city. But I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities to grow the economy because I think this really is the progressive way to deal with the situation that the city finds itself in at the moment. It's about investing into the future of our city, investing in public services, investing in infrastructure, investing our way out of this situation. And the multiplier effect of that, the benefit that that has of keeping money in communities in Liverpool, I think is hugely significant. The work that this council did, that this administration did, with the Liverpool School Investment Programme, and I remember Jane as the cabinet member for schools when we lost BSF in, in this city. And I played a small part in that as cabinet member for employment and skills in looking at how we can link that into jobs, into supporting local businesses. And what we did with that was get something like 60% local spend Money that went into Liverpool firms, that went into Liverpool jobs, that stayed in this city, that was reinvested in this city, that had a multiplier effect in this city. And I don't mean this as a criticism, but when the previous Lib Dem administration um, dealt with BSF Wave 2, where we rebuilt um, West Derby School, um, King David, and um, Gattaca, we only got a 20% local spend compared with 60% local spend. I, don't, I genuinely don't mean that as a criticism. I mean that to say that when councils choose to spend that money locally, choose to work with businesses to procure in a way that keeps that money locally, we really can make a huge difference. And I think there's some huge opportunities that we've got in Liverpool in the next few months and the next few years ahead with a local bank with foundations to be able to make an even bigger impact with that. And of course it's important that we use and um, invest to earn um, to spring in new revenue streams to the City Council to support frontline public services. It's absolutely important that we do that to protect libraries and children's centres and all the things that we value. But we've got to go beyond that so that we can genuinely create community wealth building in Liverpool, that we can keep more money in Liverpool, supporting our businesses, supporting our jobs, supporting our communities, particularly the most vulnerable, disengaged and disadvantaged communities. And the watchword around invest to and the watchword around what we do about economic development in this city should be, how does it affect the poorest people in our communities, in our city? How does it affect the single mum living in Kensington? How does this affect a neat young person living in Speak? What benefits will that bring to them? So to conclude, Lord Mayor, I think this is a really good debate and a really good position that we should be in as a city. We should unite, and it's good that we can unite across all parties and across no, um, of those of non-parties in this city. We need to be working with civil society, we need to be working with faith groups, we need to be working with trade unions, we need to be working with businesses. And we need to say, with one voice to government, Liverpool needs fair funding. We need fair funding for our city, for our services and our citizens. Thank you, Councillor Smolkin. I think we can Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd be very glad I was not going to be pleasant on this for scribbles without trying to sell my Councillor Gary Moore. Um, but um, I just wanted to raise a few points. Um, actually, Councillor Byrne's comments before I feel were actually quite relevant to this discussion because when we think about it, it is quite unfitting because austerity has squeezed the working class for every single penny that we've got. 
And what does that mean? What does that entail mean? When you take money away from those struggling most and, and, and put it where, <laughs> where you want, top down economics of what we could say. Well, it means more reliance on council services and it means more reliance on council grants such as the uh, council tax board scheme. And so that was something that actually going forward that the government has a massive part in actually tackling the issues for us here that we're facing. Now, we've been to council chemistry before Brexit and with, with respect, I mean I absolutely agree with them with regards to the effect that it could have on our city, that it will have on our city actually. However, I do like to treat them as not two entirely separate issues, but they are different because while Boris Johnson tours the country, speaking about what he wants to deliver in the next government, and I don't believe a word of what he says. Because he's only fighting it if this come up with an election on one issue, and that's his final project, that is Brexit. He's not fighting it on um, a fair deal for the pool or any other uh, local authority in the city. That's what he's fighting. And actually, the Liberal Democrats, I think it's quite, don't, I will say to you, don't play into his hands, because it's not as simple as saying, as fighting the election on the even remaining, because there are these bigger issues and wider issues that we must face. And a good point, I thought we spoke before actually, where you mentioned about uh, setting, uh, what we're talking about, setting a one year budget. And actually, um, you mentioned about the government and their responsibility in setting budget, obviously given the funding that we need um, and giving us time to plan. And that is crucial, that is absolutely crucial. But that's not what we're getting. And you think about, and we had this discussion about um, the maintained nursery schools, and we had that discussion about NHS um, and trying to fund their shortfalls and gaps in funding as well. The fact is, this government has been irresponsible and neglectful of their duty to supply the demand and service and the funding that we need in this city and across the country. And so, we speak, and we mentioned before, and Joe mentioned before, of the possibility and the potential of government commissioners coming to our council to oversee our budget and, and scrutinise what we do here. Actually, I think it's good for me that serves that visit because, as I say, they've been neglectful of their responsibilities. Thank you, Councillor. So I'm going to bring in Councillor to Simon and then I'm going to go directly to Councillor Bradford for his response. really important in this debate to look at the issues from two perspectives. I think that having this special council this early on in the budget process is extremely important because it's extremely important for every single one of us to actually understand uh, the finances of the council, how they work, how we work with our partners, those inside local governments and the voluntary sector and the cuts that those budgets uh, the cuts to the budgets to us impact on them and most of all how they impact on our communities right across the city and how they impact in very different ways but all of those negative and I think from our work with the inclusive growth plan and how we've been looking at that bottom up approach we must actually looking at what our communities need you know we're having these discussions at the same time where we're seeing our budgets slashed radically but I think sort of when we've done the discussions in the past, particularly over looking at the impact of those cuts, and particularly people understanding where those finances come from, that is extremely important. Uh, well, Mel was standing up before, we've all heard it on the doorstep when people are making an issue, whether it be about street cleansing, their bins, rats, whatever, and they say, I pay my council tax. And that is the impression because whether that's the impression they've been given, that all of the money they pay fully covers what we need to do as a city and quite clearly from those figures. So when we had the infographics one time before and we had the stuff online where actually people could try and build the budget themselves and actually say, right, I want to put all the money in children's centres, oh my God, all the libraries are closed, or 25 people haven't got a care package this week. Those things are really, really important to bring people on. And I just think people as well don't understand because they say, you know, the council don't do that. 
the voluntary sector do this, the amount of money that we put into the voluntary sector in this city, I would say, is second to none. Whether that be by direct funding or by commissioning. And certainly when the video was up before we had the guy from the White House Centre, you know, without the, it, the money that goes in from it, those services would shut, as would a lot of the voluntary sector and some of those community groups who are the lifeblood of our communities, who are actually signposted people in those uh, dire straits. And it is really bad. We've put in over 60 million in one way or another through hardship, whether that's through housing support, whether that's through the mayoral funds, and particularly those uh, funds that we can react. Imagine all that going. You know, we had a phone call this week in our ward where somebody who just given birth should be one of the happiest moments of your life, couldn't come out of hospital and we had to fund a car seat because they wouldn't allow that person home without the car seat to get home and they didn't have that. Now if we didn't have that fund and access to stuff that we could do, we've had children in our youth club fed every week, every night it's opened, we've chosen to put some of our money that we get through that hardship fund. So all the children are fed, so they actually don't feel any differently because it is a massive issue. All of those things that we're doing, if our budgets are cut, cut we don't then have the flexibility to actually you know, raise to that demand in our wards. So I think there's two things we really do need to understand how the budget works and how we set our policies. We've had a lot of criticism, you know, whether that be through the press, through opposition parties, sometimes from our own party, in respect of housing and housing strategy. Those figures show why we have to have mixed housing in this city, why we have to not just bring in the revenue from the council tax, we are creating fantastic jobs in this city through our investment, but people can't live here. So we're creating the economy for them to spend elsewhere, which means we're not creating other jobs or the expansion of small businesses. So when we're talking about community wealth building, the investment we've put into culture has led to massive small and medium-sized enterprises being able to thrive in this city. So we do have to look at the wider context of our policies and housing is one of them and people really understand, need to understand the economics of that. If we've got high earners coming to work here but they'll only go and live in Chester, the Wirral, Sefton, you know, or Greater Manchester, then we're not benefiting from the investment we put. And so we, we need to really understand fully and I think more sessions like this, I think when we start to, you know, meet with officers, coming back to smaller seminars and it's important when we set them people come along and understand because for all of us it's very easy to criticise, it's very easy to say we shouldn't do that, actually it's harder to come up with solutions and when those services are being cut years on years, I want to give a massive thanks to our staff, our staff have worked so hard and the expectations are so high. They want excellence year on, year out, and actually the pressures that are on those people we've spoke here about mental health and our workforce and our trade unions have been second to none. Obviously, all the time protecting their workers' rights, which they need to do, but fully understanding the situation we're in and wanting to work in partnership. So yeah, we all do need to work together. We need to work as a city, we need to work with other cities. We need to get those messages out and we do have to speak with one voice but we also need to understand, truly understand the challenges we face and come up with solutions, innovative solutions, solutions we can all live with and to protect the things I fought for.